neutrality is meaningless without sovereignty and soft power is meaningless without hard power. You have to first build the foundation and then you can talk about your values as much as you like. So many people say, oh, India has such great soft power or that America had soft power because of Coca-Cola and McDonald's and now we have it because of yoga and Bollywood. What soft power means is that the elite in other countries want to act in your interests and they don't even realize they're acting in your interests. They think this is their free will and it's like, oh, I'm doing the right thing for myself, but they're actually doing it for you. And India is a subject of Western soft power in that sense, the same way Mali is a subject of French soft power. People in West Africa go to a school where they are taught exclusively in French. They're told how great French civilization is. They're told that Paris is the center of the world. Their minds are massaged by constant you know, television and film that all comes from France. And then as a result, what is their society? It's an elite production line to send their best and brightest to France to contribute to the colonial metropole. Now that's soft power and it's backed up by hard power because these countries are not fully sovereign even today. Now, in the absence of that kind of power, so India clearly doesn't have it. We're the ones being subject to it. You can replace France and Mali with the US and India or Britain and India. It's the same situation. In the absence of that, all our talk of soft power is just a coping mechanism for weak countries to feel better about their own impotence. And all this Vasudeva Kutumbakam, that's for idealized situations, not for Kalyug. We live in the real world. The Earth Shastra is about realism and foreign policy in the real world. And what we have today is that it's just a slogan. And just like in the past, we had Panchil. Panchil is a fantastic set of principles. I can read them out to you. Five principles of peaceful coexistence are one, mutual respect for each other's territorial integrity and sovereignty. Two, mutual non-aggression. Three, mutual non-interference in each other's internal affairs. Four, equality and mutual benefit. And five, peaceful coexistence. Now, we talked about Panchil for decades. We named neighborhoods in Delhi Panchil Park. Did we ever apply any of these principles in our foreign policy? No, it's a free-for-all. Come and interfere in our internal affairs. We have no sovereignty. Come massage our minds. Come fill us with propaganda. Cultivate the elite. And we'll roll the red carpet for you. So that is how much soft or hard power we have. And we're constantly signaling, look at us, we're a weak state. We don't define our interests. We don't define our values. We don't define our policies. We talk about Panchil or Vasudeva Kutumbakam, and people don't even understand. They ignore it. India's back and it's going to talk about Ahimsa and Panchil again. They're going to talk about the world as one family. What a joke. We live in the real world. The only real power is hard power. And you have to acknowledge that. We don't live in an idealized world. We live in basically anarchy, internationally, geopolitically. States exist in anarchy. There is no global constitution that has any force. There's no global police that's going to come and enforce your uh, rights or guarantee your sovereignty. That's for you to do. No one else is going to come and rescue us if we're in trouble unless we're willing to do it ourselves. If we can project that kind of strength, then others will be more incentivized to at least support us. But when we lack the will and the capacity to define and defend our interests, why would anyone else do so? And that's why we're a playground for the great power policies of other countries. And we always have been. Uh, even in the 60s and 70s, people used to say it's like the whole country is for sale. You should read the archives of the KGB and the memoirs of uh, the station chiefs in New Delhi. And they're laughing at how easy it was to buy Indian politicians, bureaucrats, journalists, professors which they did easily, and so did the US. As some people got two paychecks this way. And even today, the same people are Chinese agents, the same people are American agents, the same people are Russian agents, if there's any left or if there's any money left in that, because they all share the same uh, goal, and that's to keep India weak, keep India unstable, keep India poor, because the world is very happy with the status quo. There's five big powers who won the Second World War, and as a reward, they got to design what the world looks like. The US thinks that it won the Cold War and as a result got to design what the world looked from the 90s onwards. Why would they welcome a new challenger that is strong, that's unified, that's wealthy and capable of and willing to project its power? It's in their interest to prevent that at any cost, simply from a self-interest or national interest perspective. And we would do the same as individuals or as a country if we were in that position. No one's going to roll out the red carpet for a competitor unless it was a very specific period in which they 
they did that for China as a bulwark against the Soviet Union. Now, do we have the chance to leverage Western goodwill or a political, diplomatic, military power as a bulwark against uh, China, as a country that is uh, neighboring them? Or is it more likely that we'll engage in the kind of neutrality that Finland was famous for? Uh, during the Cold War. Finland was the only neutral state that shared a physical border with the Soviet Union. Finland uh, had a policy called Finlandization, which was uh, explained in very colorful terms by uh, certain foreign policy intellectuals. And they said, Finlandization is the art of bowing to the East without mooning, without flashing your ass to the West. So that's the outcome that we want to avoid that we shouldn't be a servile country that has decided to make peace in order to maintain the status quo, because unfortunately we are a status quo country. We don't uh, set goals for India. What will India look like in 2100, the way China does? And we don't see ourselves as a civilizational state with a clear identity and uh, common vision and goals. In India, all we're doing is protecting the status quo of either 1947, that, oh, yay, we got a state thanks to the benevolence of the British, let's keep everything the way it was and prevent another partition because that's very scary. Yeah, okay. That's classic risk aversion, that you're traumatized by partition and you're so scared that it'll happen again, that you do everything in your power to keep things in that tenuous peace that you inherited. Or it's the uh, post-1971 consensus where we had the chance to finally discredit the uh, two-nation theory when uh, liberating uh, East Pakistan after the Bengali genocide. And instead of reintegrating it into India as uh, a new state, we've done that uh, with other countries. That's Sikkim became a state of the Union of India in the same decade. We're very happy to watch it turn into another Islamist state that uh, continues the same policies that it did before. So why... Would we allow that? The reason is we don't have a strategic thinking in our bureaucracy, in our policymaking units, and everyone knows that, and we're constantly signaling it. Mm-hmm.